in bright red on the top right corner on my phone. Wonderful. Screen. Okay. So today, Sophie, I'm going to be uh, discussing with you what caused the Great Depression. And uh, this lecture will be uh, based upon the uh, first two lectures. The first one is uh, what, how, how do banks work? And the second one is uh, what does it mean to own a small business or stock in a big public trade company? We are essentially conceptually the same thing. What essentially caused the Great Depression are essentially two, two things for, of uh, working together. Um, a bank run, and then what is uh, what is called a margin call, margin calls overall. So now let me um, get to uh, get back to the um, you know the, the our fictitious example of Johnny's pizza number two. Um, hey Johnny. Yes, let's do a decent uh, PowerPoint slide show. So if you remember. Johnny uh, business, um, how do I start a PowerPoint slide show? Uh, okay, so remember Johnny's uh, pizza restaurant went to a, went an IPO in 1920s. What that meant is that it was an initial public offering of uh, Johnny's, uh, the shares in Johnny Pizza number two mm -hmm. in 1920. And uh, Johnny uh, owns 20 of uh, 100 shares of that company. And South Mountain Villages collectively um, own 80 of 100 shares of that company. And back in the year of 1920, the company was expected to make 250 dollars of profit each year. And that means essentially two point, uh, two and a half dollars uh, for each share uh, that the company could either keep uh, to finance its future growth expansion, or it could distribute to all the shareholders, including Johnny himself. So in 1920, uh, the shares would initially trade it bought and sold at $12.50 per share. That gives uh, it a price earning ratio of 5.0, meaning each share is expected to uh, produce two and a half dollars of dividend. So you multiply that by five, you reach a per share sales price of $12.50. And remember that was the IPO price. Are you still there? Hey, Sophie. Yeah, I'm just on mute. Okay. So that was a very reasonable price, meaning you put $12.50 down to buy a share of the stock and you expect um, you are entitled to receive $2.50 of a dividend each year. That's very reasonable. That's a little bit you know, more than reasonable from the buyer's perspective, okay? now. From 1920s uh, to the year 1929, right before the stock market crash, Johnny's Pizza, the whole company, grows its profit by 7% each year. That's not exactly um, overly optimistic, it's very reasonable. And that's in line with the growth of the entire economy of the country from the same time period. Uh, at, at sort of reliable uh, proxy of economic growth, the true economic growth is electricity consumption. And electricity consumption during the same nine or 10 years grew about 7% each year. What does that mean is that in 10 years, the annual profit of Johnny's Pizza number two, just probably like the national economy, uh, doubled. Uh, so there's this 72 rule, which is very rough rule. Essentially, it means that if if your profit grows by like, say for example, 6% each year, in 12 years, you're gonna double your profit. If your profit grows by about 8% um, each year, you divide it at 72 by eight, it takes nine years for you to double it. Um, 
is compounding, which I will um, explain to you in one of the future lectures. What, how does interest rate works? How does compounding uh, work? So in 1920, at price earning ratio of uh, five, the entire company um, was all of the shares, 100 shares was, uh, were worth uh, $1,250, right? So in 1929, the price earning ratio shot up to 30. And the whole, whole company, remember, is profit has doubled, right? So since the profit has doubled to uh, $500 and its earning price earning ratio, ratio had shot up to 30, that means the whole company, uh, the value of the whole company had ballooned to $15,000. And there were still 100,000, 100 shares outstanding, assuming uh, that's still the case. Each share is $150 now. So every villager, you know, thought, you know, I, if I own 10 shares uh, back in 1920s, you, you could buy me a house now. And 10 shares, it would cost you in 1920s only $125. So it's just a little bit above, you know, the, the, the saving uh, of uh, average household then. And, and imagine an average household could have uh, afford two houses if they bought the stock back then. So you can hear something is wrong here because the entire economy certainly has not grown that much to provide, you know, two single family homes for every household. So now here's what happened. If you look, this is a, a diagram illustrating um, the um, S&P 500, essentially the price earning ratio from 1920 to 2003. You look at the most, uh, the left most side, you see in 1920s, the price earning ratio of uh, stocks in the S&P 500 was around seven to eight. And given that Johnny Pisa was a very small company initially and it had more risk than a large company. And so it probably, a price earning ratio of five was not totally too low. And then you see in 1929, right before the stock market crash, it was, the price earning ratio was more than 30, right, Be below 35. So what the example I give you was not exactly extreme. It was actually pretty representative of what, what happened to most stocks between 1920 and 1929. Essentially, you know, you see it went from, it went up more than 10 times. Wow. Yeah. So as the share price went up, people started to trade shares for like gain. You know, I bought it for $10, I, I would sell it for $15. Uh, that's, you know, trading, right? People forgot that when you, whether you own a small, uh, whether you own a business or whether you own shares in a public trade company, uh, what should determine the price of the entire small business or a share of a public trade company was the earning capacity of the entire company and the earning capacity allocated to your shares, right? And you should pay you know, uh, for the shares of a company or entire business, uh, you know, based upon that, not based upon, you know, what you may be able to sell it for um, in the future to the next bigger fool. Um, so when the price went up from, you know, $12.50 to $150, right? So the dividend a villager could get from one share of Johnny Pizza was only 3% of the $150 that, you know, that the stock is selling, was selling for right before the crash. So the stock price went up by $137.50. On average, it's like $14 each year. Of course, it's, this is very rough. I mean, um, yeah. it, at, you know, toward that, end of the 1920s and right before the crash, you can imagine the price jumped much um, more in absolute values, but um, sort of proportionately, you, everybody was expecting their shares to grow by, you know, 15, 20, 30% each year, the price. People who this would continue, they forgot that they were supposed to pay um, 
a share of a public share company based upon how much earning a share could deliver to them. So, and people forget about that. It's because they are sort of addicted uh, to this um, profit um, based upon the price increase of the share itself. And people start to borrow money to trade. And no. that's, that's, you know, just, that could make your problem worse. But remember, I mean, sometimes you have to, you have to borrow money, you have to leverage it up. Uh, remember, just like how Johnny, how he succeeded, right? He had to borrow nine hundred dollars uh, from Mr. Bank uh, to finance the purchase of his uh, first restaurant, right? But mm -hmm. people now could borrow money to buy stock, uh, and that's what a lot of people did. So uh, let's give you an, uh, uh, another person. Let's say he, Richie, right? Richie, he only had one hundred fifty dollars in cash and that's his saving. But he borrowed $150 from the bank to buy two shares, okay? Actually, at least it's not, you know, aggressive at all. Back then, people sometimes borrow two or three times or four or five times of the cash they had to buy more shares. So Johnny bought those two shares of John, I mean, Richie bought these two shares of Johnny Pizza shares, all right? And both of those two shares were pledged to the bank as collateral because the bank figured that if the share price went down, right, the bank could take both of Johnny's shares. And so long as the shares did not go down by more than 50%, right, the bank could sell the share and get its $150 back from Johnny. Do you follow me, Sophie? Yeah, kind of. No, you have to totally understand this. There's no kind of it here. You know, it's very simple mathematics. The shares were traded $150 per share, right? Yeah. Johnny had only $150, right? Mm -hmm. But Johnny went to the bank and borrowed $150 from the oh, bank. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. So he, he had $300 now, right? Mm hmm so he could buy two shares, got it? Yeah. So Johnny figured that if those two shares, you know, the price go, goes up to $200, $250 per share, right? Mm -hmm. He would have $500, right? And then he need pay $150 principal back to Mr. Banker, right? Yeah. And of course, Mr. Banker never lent anything to anybody free of, interest right interest. yeah so there's 20% annual interest that means $30 of interest right mm -hmm. or $150 loan right yeah so Johnny figured that even after the interest of $30 after the principal repayment of $150 kids $150 original investment would turn into $320 next year if the price went up from $150 to $250. And people were used to that kind of price increase, okay? Yeah. I mean, if it takes more than one year, that's still fine. All he need to pay is just another $30 of interest, right? Mm -hmm. So he would still be making a lot of money. He would be making $290 approximately, but just using $150. And Mr. Banker figured even if the shares, you know, go down to $70 per share, both shares will, will be $150 and he could foreclose. He could essentially take those two shares and sell them and then he will be made whole. He, his $150 principal will be back. For a moment, let's forget about his interest. You know what I mean? So Mr. Yeah. Banker feel pretty safe. Got it? Okay except it's not safe. Oh, okay. oh, that's so, ominous. Yeah, and one day there was this panic, okay? Everybody just start to sell because everybody who has got cash who could borrow money have done that, right? Has done that. And then yeah. there, was no, there were no longer buyers with money trying to buy shares. When, you know, 
so the, there are 100 shares of Johnny Pizza outstanding, right? But not every shares are being bought and sold every day, right? Yeah. So you just need to have, in one day, somebody who were desperate, who need money, right? Who, and could not mm -hmm. find a buyer. And he started to sell Johnny Pizza share at $70 per share, right? And that would trigger just, you know, all these, you know, domino effects, right? So one day somebody did that, he could not find a buyer, and then he had to sell his Johnny Pizza share at $70 per share, right? So reach his two shares are not enough to repay the $150 loan to Mr. Bankers now, right? Mm -hmm. So Richie will get a call from Mr. Banker, essentially telling him, Richie, put in $10 cash today, okay? You're broke. You're broke. Because you your dead. two shares are only worth $140, not enough to repay the principal of your loan to me, right? If you don't put in another additional $10 in into my bank, I'll sell your two shares for $70, meaning for $140 in total, right? And Johnny has, he did not even have, have 10 additional dollars. Remember, he, he borrowed, he had put all his money into the stock market, right? And more, he borrowed, right? So there goes Johnny's $150 saving and $230 hope. And Mr. Banker only lost, you know, Mr. Banker lost to say um, $10, you know, if this happened to the next day after Johnny bought his shares, right? Mm -hmm. Not counting the interest due to Mr. Bank. So this is what we call a margin call. Okay. Yeah. And another reason that so many shares went up, uh, their price went up so much during the 1920s is what we call pump and dump by the banks of the world. Okay. They would buy a lot of shares um, they, uh, from a lot of companies. Right, or, you know, when they underwrite their IP, which I will explain to you in future lecture. Okay. Okay. And then they will encourage people, naive people like John Richie, who do not really understand what it means to own shares um, of a company, or you know, what does ownership uh, of a business means. What you know, are not. You know, Johnny, you know, Johnny understands the ups and the downs of business and the risks of, you know. Good for Johnny. Yeah. Remember, Johnny, what in uh, the, you know, second lecture I give to you, I explained to uh, you how, you know, Johnny's business could be exposed if, you know, his sales goes down, his, the, the, the profit could go down so much and he could incur a loss and could lose his house. And all that. But a lot of people do not understand that the same thing could happen, you know, it, it, it's Johnny's company, could happen to the entire Johnny's company, could happen to their shares, but most people did not understand that. And with all the banks out there selling the shares to naive people, um, you know, the price just keep, kept going up. People could not understand could, uh, how and why it could come down, right? But, you know, down it came. And after price got pumped up, the banks of the world, the sophisticated people start to dump shares. And that's probably what happened in 1929. Uh, yeah. So on October 24th, 1929, I remember this day because that's, you know, October 24th was grandpa's birthday, okay? And suddenly, suddenly there were far fewer and fewer buyers. And on that day, the price dropped by 11% of the overall market, okay? Mm -hmm. And then another 12% dropped on October 28th, and another 12% dropped on October 29th. So the stock market lost more than 30% of its value just in a matter of days. Oh, damn. And millions of people like Richie had to sell their shares due to margin calls, right? Because they could, they, they did not have more cash to sort of a fear of the gap between the price of their share then and the money they borrowed from the bank. And remember, Richie just borrowed one and one to one ratio. Some people borrowed three or four times of the money they actually had going into the market, okay? 
-hmm. And then there were no more, you know, what we call bigger fool to buy from them, okay? To hold their back, you know? So, you know, they, when the music stopped, you know, nobody was willing to buy from poor people like Richie, okay? And in the next three years, share price declined by more than 90%, so 90%. Okay, mm -hmm. and so uh, you when when Mr. Banker lent money to Johnny, he he his risk management was that if the stock market did not go down by fifty percent, I should be fine. But stock market kind of you know did. yeah did and just you know broke his assumption. So and then there was this bank run. People suddenly realized like Bank of South Mountain probably lost a lot of its own money in the stock market and in loans, you know, the bank, you know, learned to people like rich, right? Because we're talking about 90, 50, 30% of market, you know, crash just in a matter of days. So and now every villager want their $100 back. And you remember in my first lecture how bank rush bank work, right? When not, to mention when everybody, when enough proportion of you know people who deposit money in the money in the bank want the money at the same time from the bank, you are yeah. gonna have a bank run. Okay? Yeah. And so Mountain Bank definitely did not have the money, even when it did not have so much, even if it did not have risky loans, you know, to reach it, right? Even if it had just, you know, the, the normal kind of loans to, you know, Sophie, the lawyer, or, or Richie, the small businessman, right? Small business owner, right? Mm -hmm. So South Mountain Bank declared bankruptcy, okay? No. And the villagers lost so much money in the stock market. They no longer, you know, go to Johnny's Pizza uh, to buy pizza. And then that, you know, just further reduce the cash inflow and profitability of the company. Johnny had to lay off people, right? and then it becomes a vicious circle of market crash, unemployment, bankruptcy, and about twenty-five percent of people um, lost their job, and there were groups and just you know like like, like you know crowds and crowds of men, uh, unemployed men, like just wandering about the country looking for jobs, and that was the Great Depression. And the government back then, um, before the Great Depression, did not really regulate the banks, did not really regulate uh, the stock market, and did not have any kind of regulation saying, no, you cannot borrow you know, more than um, this much of money to, to, to claim in the, in the stock market. You know, you, no, you cannot lend that much money out at the bank. No, you. Uh, yes, uh, if a bank fails, uh, we, the government, will guarantee your depositors money. There were, were, there were no such kind of government regulations or sort of a, uh, a safety valve uh, to uh, for the entire economic um, infrastructure, including the bank and the stock market. And, and uh, because we believe in last fair uh, economy, we believe that uh, government should have, have not little as possible to do with the economy. And then all these kind of uh, free market forces conspire to cause uh, so much, um, you know, unemployment, bank failures, and stock market crashes. And, 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 uh, that's why a lot of people who went through that the Great Depression period, they, uh, they, they never uh, want to have anything to do with the stock market. And some people went so far, they would not even deposit money mm -hmm. in the bank. That's the Great Depression and how it happened. You have any questions? No, but it was solved by um, like World War II helped it, right? And uh, World War II kind of created this kind of a, a demand uh, for, yeah. frankly, for a lot of, uh, you know, uh, war-related uh, equipment and materials. But before then, um, 
FDR uh, was elected president and, and he offered this new deal. Essentially, the government would not have a new deal with the people, okay? Government would have to regulate the economy. Government would impose certain labor sort of conditions and regulations and, and bank and stock market regulation. And Joseph uh, Kennedy, President um, John F. Kennedy's father, was appointed as the first commissioner of the Stock and Exchange Commission, the SEC, to regulate the stock market. And so the government now essentially saying, we now have a new deal with you. We, the government, will have the power to, to some extent, regulate the economy, OK? And you, the people, would have certain um, the industries and, and business owners will be subject to this new regulation. Uh, but in return, the government will have some kind of responsibilities as well. Uh, for example, will guarantee your, or your deposit in the bank. Uh, that, I think, originally is what it meant, the government and the people uh, and the business community struck a new deal. That's why it was called a new deal. Got it? Why and, does it say here's what, Richie? Huh? <laughs> I it's don't know. a very ironic name, rich, yeah. Great Depression, kind of, you know, contrasting here. Yeah. And, and, and then the government started to build huge um, um, public uh, projects, like uh, I think, not highways, but other projects, and which also would hire a lot of people out of unemployment. And that's um, that sort of paved the way of, uh, for the recovery. And then there was World War II. But World War II was not sort of the, war gen the, the demand generated by war contribute to the economy. Uh. Okay. But, uh, but, and, but the Great Depression in the United States caused to a large extent World War II uh, because the ripple effect uh, in European economy. And job loss and, and all these um, you know domestic um, uh, unrest and, and to a large extent and that to uh, the grab of power by people like Hitler. Okay, so what Johnny did and what Richie did and what Banker Mr. Banker did in the South and South Mountain Village uh, contributed to World War Two. And, and other tragedies in the world. Because people forgot about, you know, the economic principles underlining business and share ownership and, and banks um, took the risks that they should not have taken, okay? All right, let me uh, pause for today. Okay. Thank you for your lesson, Professor. <laughs> let me let, let me talk to you later after I end this meeting. Okay. Please send Oreos to the house. Sure. <laughs>